It is my privilege to welcome you to the 2020 Central Coast Local Health District Memorial Service. My name is Dr Sally Carr and I am the Director of the Central Coast Palliative Care Service. Before we commence, I would like to give an acknowledgement to country. Central Coast Local Health District acknowledges the Dark and Jung people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live. We acknowledge and recognise all First Nations people who have come from their own country and now call this country their home. We pay respect and acknowledge our First Nations ancestors that have walked and cared for these lands for many generations before us. We acknowledge our elders who are knowledge holders, teachers and pioneers, and our youth who are emerging leaders in this community. We recognise the unique cultural and spiritual relationship and celebrate the contributions of First Nations people to Australia. 2020 has been challenging in ways that none of us could have foreseen. The normal patterns and routines of all of our lives have changed and it has been difficult to maintain those human connections that do so much to enrich and sustain us. To lose someone during a time when large gatherings are restricted, thereby preventing the sharing of collective grief, is a double blow. The local health district, like all of you during this COVID crisis, has had to embrace new technologies in order to enable this service to be possible. It is our hope that this memorial service gives you the opportunity to take the time to remember, honour and reflect on the life of the person who has died. I would suggest that in order to view this service that you find a quiet place, somewhere that you find safe and comforting, and give yourself the space that you need to remember. Remembering is an intensely personal time. If watching the service today is causing you too much distress, be kind to yourself. Take a break and choose another time to revisit the service when you are ready. Thank you. My name is Anne Howe and I'm a bereavement counsellor with the LHD Palliative Care Service on the Central Coast. I sometimes visit patients for end-of-life counselling or to provide counselling to the family and friends of the patient, either before or after the patient has died. I may have met you and your loved one who has died, or perhaps I haven't. But regardless of whether I have met you and your loved one or not, I cannot help but think of you all as heroes. The patients are heroes because of all the suffering they experienced during their illness and the emotions that they may have experienced as they face their inevitable death. What courage that must have taken. And for you, who were the patient's carers, how brave you were as you witnessed the deterioration of your loved one's health. At times you would worry about your loved one when their appetite had decreased and they were barely eating. After cooking a meal that your loved one used to enjoy, to your dismay, they barely touched the food. But when they asked for something different to eat and you didn't have it in the home, you would rush to the shop to purchase the item just in case they would eat it. And how many nights did you lie in bed, sleeping very lightly, just in case your loved one woke up? wanting to go to the toilet, or needing some medication, or even just to know that you are there for them. You are not only their husband, or their wife, or their child, or their friend. You are also their nurse, a role that you had not had any experience in. However, you adapted and you did what you had to do. So you are the heroes. Then when your loved one died, you were left feeling numb and in disbelief that they had died. While you knew how ill they were, it was difficult to accept that they had died so soon. Some of you would say, I didn't expect him or her to die so soon. For others, the person's death was unexpected as their illness was quite short. 
So there you were left alone and your world had completely changed. You've had to face challenges and deal with them in your own way. You have had to make decisions that you have not had to make before because you used to share them with your loved one. How much courage has it taken for you to continue when you have struggled to make sense out of all that has happened? And there would have been times when you have felt very confused that this has happened at all. For many of you it has been a very lonely time as you have had to face this world without the person that you love. However, somehow you have done that. So you are the heroes. The grief experience has been described by many as a storm. I would like to share with you something written by a Japanese writer, Harukuki Murakami. And he wrote about this storm. And when the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. And that is what this storm is all about. Hello, my name is Penny and I'm a palliative care volunteer. Please listen while I read this poem. It's called In Our Hearts. We thought of you today, but that is nothing new. We thought about you yesterday and days before that too. We think of you in silence. We often speak your name. Now all we have are memories and your picture in a frame. Your memory is our keepsake, with which we'll never part. God has you in his keeping, we have you in our heart. We're now going to light a candle to honour and remember those that we have lost. You may also wish to light a candle, or perhaps choose some other symbol to honour the person you cared about. The candle signifies your tribute of life and love in the face of your loss. Hello, my name is Jane. I'm a nurse at Gosford Hospital. Please listen as I read this cry for comfort. We've come today carrying much pain over the death of someone we cared about who showed courage and suffered, ultimately losing their lives. At this time, many of us are struggling to make sense of what has happened and we feel confused and are hurting. At times we've wondered why and have even felt punished. We've wondered what has been done that all this suffering has come upon us. It doesn't feel fair. At times, some of us have felt angry and let down. For many of us, this is a lonely time. When our loved one died, it was as though a light went out and that now the world no longer shines as brightly. Help us to reach out to others for comfort in the midst of our pain. Sustain us when others around us let us down, when they misunderstand us, perhaps even avoid us or say things that hurt. Keep us from isolation and loneliness. Help us to care for ourselves, that we might allow ourselves the space we need to feel, to grieve, and to remember. Help us to celebrate the life of the one we now grieve and help us to treasure the precious memories that we shared.
Hello, my name is Dr. Susan Newton and I'm a palliative care physician. When I sat down to prepare what I would say to you today, it didn't take me very long to realise that almost everything that I know about grief and loss, about bereavement, comfort and healing, I didn't learn from medical school. As you know, or will come to know, the best lessons are learned by simply living your life. I'm not going to regale you with the latest research on what you should be feeling as you sit here in remembrance with us, nor am I going to deliver a best practice lecture on how to behave when you're suffering or sad. Instead, I hope you'll forgive my indulgence as I tell you some of my stories. When I was 17, my favourite grandmother died, very suddenly, and it was my first significant loss. I cried myself to sleep for what seemed like weeks after she died. Everything in those days that followed was as if in slow motion, like walking through treacle or thick porridge. Now, looking back some 40 years later, there are a few things that stand out to me from the overwhelming numbness of my loss as clearly as if it was yesterday. One is being woken from a fitful sleep by her voice calling my name in an ever-diminishing soothing. Two is the memory of the crisp white bowling dresses of the ladies who formed a guard of honour at her funeral. I think I was hugged and perfumed to within an inch of my life by those beautiful nameless women. And three is the memory of my mother crying softly when she opened the mail two weeks after my grandmother died. A photograph of my grandmother was there for her, not seen before. She was the most gentle woman I had ever known, was written in wobbly script on the back of the photo. It was a gift to us from a friend of Nana's we had never met. When I was 33, I was hospitalised for a month, very unwell from complications of a premature birth. The grief of not fulfilling the mythology of a perfect birth or not successfully breastfeeding felt like it was a kick to the guts, a shameful, nauseating physical pain. Trussed up like a turkey, too weak to clean my teeth, attached to a monitor, every monitor known to modern medicine, and with a beautiful two-month premature son being monitored in a humidity crib some two floors above me, I don't think I have ever felt so helpless, so vulnerable, or so small. And then in walked Sally, a Malaysian-born midwife, my nurse for the day. She smiled and walked past the foot of my bed and very gently pinched the sheet above my feet and relieved the pressure on my toes. I remain inarticulate at describing what that felt like. The release the freedom, the relief of suffering that I didn't consciously know I even had. But from that point on, I knew I would be all right. A few years ago, my father died. After a long chronic illness, he died not at home or in a hospice, but in an intensive care unit. The only medical palliation he received came from me in those last hours as I finally leapt from my previously self-imposed role to be his daughter only, into palliative care doctor and demanded they give him appropriate comfort care. They patronisingly sent us all home as they said he would settle better in a quieter room. So we dutifully left, wounded and raw, only to be called back some two hours later to see his body. I watched my son stroke my mother's hands as they sat in the waiting room. As we left, weighed down with Dad's toiletries, his watch and his wedding ring, a young nurse ran to my mother and said very quietly, I was with him when he died. I held his hand. I locked myself away from the world for 24 hours after Dad died. I wondered if I was the first human to ever hibernate, albeit for a day or two. My lovely husband did the housework unnagged. He fended off well-meaning callers and held me as once again I cried myself to sleep, despite shouldering his own grief. 
I remember being alone in the house one morning and hearing the screen door click. Not giving a damn about a burglary, I turned my back on the sound and went back to sleep. But when I woke, there was a huge hamper of bread and milk, and cheese and fruit there on the kitchen table. A close friend, unannounced, unintrusive. In the days and weeks and months that followed Dad's death, I came to realise how many tears and how much snot we can make when put to the test. Late at night, when I was restless with loss, I would put on my headphones and play the same music over and over again. Gurumul, the blind Aboriginal singer-songwriter, singing of love, life and loss in Indigenous language. After an evening out in a car park late one night, my closest friend held me for what seemed an eternity as the primal pain of Dad's death finally found a voice. And my family, well, my brother began a, a long run of doing odd jobs on top of his usual work, lost in activity, keeping ever busy to ward off the pain. And my mother, banned from the garden by my father for her rather excessive pruning techniques, began an interest in gardening, taken up with extreme vigour and continuing today. I went back to work two weeks after the funeral. Some said I was bonkers, that I was too early, that it was not appropriate, but it was where I wanted to be. The first patient I saw had the same illness my father had and the same family configuration as mine. There was a bittersweet pleasure in making this man's remaining days comfortable. But I sobbed in the lift as I left the ward and later in the bath as if I was a child again. I stumbled through work for months, uh, gradually becoming stronger through the observance of the rituals around palliative care. I watched unseen one day as the palliative care liaison nurse chatted comfortably with a man as she gently and tenderly washed and massaged his feet. The kitchen staff on the ward made a birthday cake, especially for a woman who, unbeknownst to them, had only hours left to live. And I cried with relief and wonder and gratitude as I alone witnessed the last breath of a woman, a loner, with no friends or family. Recently, I went to my uncle's funeral. He was the quintessential larrikin. You'd fix anything he turned his hand to and the first to stand up to help anyone out and the biggest torment I had ever known. He taught me and every kid in the world, it would seem, how to drive a car. On a trip to Sydney in the train, he suffered a catastrophic heart attack. Struggling with trying to support him and to get help, my aunt was approached by four teenage girls who divided into pairs and went to different ends of the train to organise for the train to stop, ultimately assisting in getting him to the nearest hospital. At the funeral, those four young girls blushed as they received a huge warm round of applause. Now I'm sure that you're much cleverer than I am and have noticed already what I noticed only as I wrote this, that the common theme throughout all these stories is not only death or grief or loss. Death and dying, grief and loss have opened my eyes to the exquisite beauty of comfort. Come fort. It means with strength. And so these things I know to be true. Comfort is effortless and sincere. It seems to happen out of the corner of your eye or when you least expect it or when you most need it. And you feel it right here, right here in your chest or in your gut where all things true are best felt. Comfort can be found in a number, the number two, because to be comforted requires a relationship. It can be a fleeting relationship or one far removed or one as intimate as you will ever experience, but a relationship nonetheless. Whether that relationship is with your God, your partner, your children, your friends, your family, your workmates, your community, your pets, your hobbies, or with a total stranger on a train, or, or permutations of all of these, there is comfort to be found and to be experienced if you open up and engage with another. There is comfort in the intimacy of touch and voice, in prayer and ritual, in gardening and in song, in physical effort and in rest, 
in creativity and in tears. For me, there is comfort to be found everywhere I look, with my family, with my friends, in words, in colours, in the ephemera of birds and clouds, in my garden and with my chickens, in singing and in my hands, and in your hands. Comfort is warm and surprising. There's comfort being here talking with you because you, like me, whether we like it or not, have an intimate relationship with grief and loss. Grief and loss informs and enriches our lives. There is comfort in the hand you hold, in the candle that you light, in an upward glance and a sigh that you make to the night sky and in sharing a cup of tea. Comfort, like grief, is about being loved and loving in return. And for me, there is comfort in knowing that you and I, like others before us, will be healed through the comfort we give and the comfort we receive and accept in return. Thank you for choosing to view our memorial service. We hope that it has given you the opportunity to remember, honour and reflect. This service may have evoked some difficult emotions for you and in that you will not be alone. Sometimes loss can be overwhelming and there are organisations that can offer help during this difficult time. Here are some contact details for you.